Good evening and welcome to the Truth Report. I'm Barry Newsbaum. We have a very special guest today. We have Phil Haney with us. You might recognize Phil as one of the founding members of Homeland Security here in the United States. He's a 35-year member of law enforcement with an expertise in Middle Eastern and terror policy. And we are going to talk about the breaking news here in the United States today, all about John Bolton leaving the White House and its implications on American policy. But before we get started, I want to make sure you remember that you can text TRUTH, the word is TRUTH, to 88202 to subscribe to our mailing list and you will never miss an exciting episode and future episodes, videos, articles will come directly to your phone simply by sending truth to 88202. So Phil, welcome aboard. It's great to have you today. Great. Thank you so much. So Bolton's gone. In a general sense, without knowing the new National Security Advisor, what do you think changes, if any, will be in Trump's national security policy overall? Well, let's start with the most immediate example, that would be Afghanistan. Apparently, what precipitated this, this break, this disconnect between Bolton and Trump, had to do with his intention to bring members of the Taliban and also the president of Afghanistan to Camp David. My impression, based on what I know of Trump, is that he literally wanted to sit them in the same room, face to face. Because as you know, the Taliban has insisted that they will not negotiate with the current government of Afghanistan in Kabul. So they've been negotiating with our, our emissary in Qatar for the last year and a half, and we've been letting them do it. And somewhere along in this process, Trump woke up in the middle of the night or someone actually informed him, hey, you're negotiating with the Taliban, we already are, what would be so different only geographically to have them come here instead? And I should also mention that five of the 14 members of the Taliban negotiating team were the infamous Guantanamo Taliban. So that's astonishing to me that at one time they were in Gitmo and now they're on the negotiating team. So if people had concerns about that, vis-a-vis -vis Taliban and Camp David, it would seem to me they would have brought them up a long time ago. So somewhere in this process of President Trump's proposal to sit down face-to-face -face with all the parties and see if maybe he could come up with a statesman-like uh, solution to the problem, he ran into conflict and pushed back from his own staff. So what I, and then he announced, and I applaud the courage that he had to say the talks are dead. It's over. He didn't say we're not going to have any more. It's just that the way they've been, I'm not happy with them. That's it. We're not going to do it anymore. And I think that was right. Because if we would have signed on the bottom line, it would have been in one of the most humiliating diplomatic defeats that we've ever suffered. Because the Taliban would have handed us our, our supper on a plate. But so now he's going to step back. He's going to look at it. And as you said, we're going to really know a lot about who he ends up appointing to be the next security advisor. We'll have a lot of idea from there. But he's going to slow down on Afghanistan. I mean, he's let, also me, let me stop you before we move to other geographic locations, Phil. In regards to the Taliban, you've interrogated, interrogated Taliban, correct? I've interrogated. It's called interview. Never okay. interrogated anybody. <laughs> <laughs> So let me ask you, based on your, your interviews, <laughs> where one of you was free and the other one wasn't, yes. uh, and we know who was walking around and who wasn't, mm -hmm. is there any sense within you that in a negotiation with these people who are radical Islamists that want to rule according to strict Sharia interpretation, can we ever long-term believe anything they agree to? 
No, because they've already they've already made it public. They've already issued public statements on their own media platforms, applauding themselves and being honored by others in Al Qaeda of the Indian subcontinent, or of Islamic State, or other subgroups that they've already won in Afghanistan. And the way that they signal that in the icon of the, the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan is to show a white flag with black uh, Arabic writing on it. Whenever you see a white flag in an icon anywhere in the world, Islamic, it means they've already achieved the victory. That's the point of the flag. So when they, when they publish, put out press releases and commentary on the proceedings, if they show a white flag, it means from their perspective, they've already won. They own, they control 70% of the country already, minimum. And that's not counting the influence of Iran. That's not counting the influence of Pakistan. That's not counting the influence of these other subgroups and or Al Qaeda and or Islamic State. If you add all those up together, really the only places left is a little island called Kabul. Virtually the whole of the country is already taken. So what exactly were we negotiating for? It, it reminds me somewhat of the withdrawal from Vietnam. Um, our troops were literally sailing away and Vietnam was on the way to falling apart. Um, I don't see it going to be any different in Afghanistan, which if you think about all the blood and treasure that we have left all over that country, we went in, there was a brutal Islamic control they were destroying everything that was outside of their very strict religious teaching. And now, all those billions of dollars later and all those thousands of Americans wounded and killed, we're just going to hand them the keys and say, bye, guys. Well, we're going to hand the keys to two people or two countries, actually several. But the roster includes China. China is just sitting there like a vulture up on the wire waiting for us to withdraw, and they're going to swoop in and take it all. Our own geologists discovered three-plus trillion dollars worth of rare earth elements and other unrefined things like gold and silver and so on. As soon as we leave, China's going to come in and buy it all. And China doesn't care about domestic policy. They never put any qualifiers or caveats on what they do. They make a deal. We, they say that we want $5 billion worth of cobalt. That's all they care about. So we have China sitting there poised. We have Pakistan. We have Iran, which is only too glad to destabilize anything that America tries to do. And Annie knows this, of course, and if you just look at a map of the eastern border of Afghanistan, of Iran, You'll notice that half of the border is Iran, I mean Afghanistan, and the other half of the border is Pakistan. They both touch right up, and there's a city right at that T-point that's a funnel for everything coming from the west right into the battlefield of Afghanistan, just like the city of Peshawar on the eastern side is a funnel right through the Khyber Pass into Afghanistan. So it's essentially the world's battlefield which does segue to Pakistan and our policy with Pakistan. Thanks, thanks Phil. That, Welcome. Was, that was great stuff. Uh, thanks for joining us today on the Truth Report. You can always go to our website, americantruthproject.org. You can find it by just typing in findberry.com. That takes you right to the website where you can sign up so you never miss an exciting episode. And don't forget, text TRUTH to 88202, 88202 gets you on our mailing list, and this time you'll get all of our stuff for free right in your phone every single day without having to do anything more to do. Again, thanks for joining us. I'm very useful.